Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the man, the myth, the legend. He finally said yes. <laughs> every, every time I see you, you give me crap about being on the podcast. And it was like, I'm just waiting on you to say yes. We worked it out, right? We worked it out. And now come out, my grandfather, believe that one. My my son and daughter-in-law had a, had a little baby girl a couple weeks ago, Carter. And I'm, a, I'm too young to be a grandfather, but I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to pretend like I'm an, even older and more crotchety than I am. Well, and, and you know, I am even closer to your daughter than I am to you. And there now you go. she's married, so you could be a grandfather again. I know. It's that, t- it's that time of life. So I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to embrace it. So what do we got today, man? What are we going to talk about? Well, first, I got to tell, tell our listeners your background, because I think people okay. know you as the TC commentator, but you are sort of an aficionado, have dived into every area. So look, college player of the year in 1984. Finished the year number 12 and 85, which we have not seen that happen in recent times where someone's, you know, NCAA champ uh, of the indoors or your number one player in college and next year, top 12 in the world. Uh, Coach Pete Sampras, Tim Hinman, Stan Wawrinka briefly, Sloan briefly, on Team Fritz, always whispering in the background, whether he's in the box or not, managing director of USDA High Performance Program. Very famously coached Roger Federer for two years to his seventh Wimbledon title and was one of the sort of first sort of minds involved in bringing play site to fruition, which is a very well-known tool used by junior tennis now in analytics. So this is Paul Anacone, listeners. We are very lucky to have you on. Thank you for joining. Thank you, my friend. I'm looking forward to it. And we don't get to see each other much. So let's uh, let's have some fun. So I think about you, I put, I have this short list, right? As a Midwest guy, cold weather climate guy, I have this list of people when people say, oh, you don't make it from a cold weather climate. You don't make it from the Midwest. You don't make it from New York. And then I start rattling off, you know, Jack Sock from KC, James Blake from New York, Donald Young, Taylor Townsend from Chicago. Um, and then you, New York guy, right? All, went to school in Tennessee. Uh, won national indoors, top 12 player in the world, and just like a staple on the tennis thing. What is your take on playing tennis in New York climate? Because I just say, we just hosted the boys level 116s at my facility. And the best player in the tournament by far was from Rochester, New York. Still have the the the, the complaints we hear about indoor climates, not enough court right. time, not enough hitting partners, not enough competition. <clears throat> um you know, nobody to play with, but somehow still make it. What's your thought about making it from a cold weather climate and the move to Florida, having been somebody that made it? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because different times back in the dark ages, Kamal, I actually, I grew up in New York, but I, I did go to Ball Terry's. I went to Ball Terry's. I went to Nick's uh, Academy when I was 13, 14 for uh, two and a half, three and a half years. But now I grew up in New York on Eastern Long Island. The nearest indoor club was 35 miles away. So that's a, that's a different that's a different kettle of fish. You're driving 35 miles each way. And I had parents that both worked. I couldn't do it. I mean, I was playing twice a week, maybe you know once or twice a week. And so I had to go to Balteri's uh, or a place like that. And I, I never would have made it without Nick and without his program. But that being said, in today's day and age, with the amount of facilities and the amount of great coaches and great resources that are around, if you're near a facility, there's no reason you can't do it. There's absolutely no reason. With all the stuff with sports science, um, the programming that you can figure out and find out online, strength and conditioning, nutrition, all the support stuff that you need that just recently exists, uh, came into existence the last decade, decade and a half, there's no reason you can't do it. Sure, in warm weather climate, it's much easier. Uh, it's more convenient, um, but there's no reason that you can't do it. To me, the biggest thing is to have smart people around you um, and to have people that really know what they don't know. That's your parents and that's the people that are around you. They need to know what they don't know and get people around them that do know and trust them and get the team around them so that they know 
how they should be trained, how much they should be training, what should they be doing off court. And then you can set up um, the group around um, your child that can maximize their talent, whatever that level is. So it absolutely can be done now, but get the right people around to help you. So when did you make the move? Were you top 20 in the country? You know, because I mean, I was, yeah, I was, let's see, 14s. I might have been, yeah, I might. I was probably top 20 in the country in the 14s and, you know, top five in the East or six in the East. Um, but I just knew if I wanted to chase my dreams, you know, I couldn't do it there. And my mom, you know, was a big push. She was a, she was a kind of, she was a tennis mom. I mean, she was into it. She really pushed hard. My dad was more back, you know, took a step back. Um, and she was like, you should go down there. You should go down there. And at the beginning, I didn't like it because I, I didn't understand as a 14 year old, what the sacrifice was going to be like till I got there. But once I got settled in, um, I really did like it. And I learned a lot as, as a young player, but I come out, I think I, I don't, I, I think I would have gotten a college scholarship you know, if I stayed in New York and I think I would have gone to a good school and played college tennis, I don't think I ever would have made it on the pro tour. I, I found my two early mentors in, in Mike DePalmer Sr., the late, great Mike DePalmer Sr., my college coach at University of Tennessee, and Nick Politeri. And then my brother kind of took the helm as I turned pro. And my brother's a great coach and teacher and knew me better than anybody. So I had a, I had a kind of a triumphant of unbelievable people navigating my pathway but if I didn't go to Knicks and I didn't get that access, I, I really don't believe I would have made a living playing tennis. Mm. But I don't think that's the case now. I think it's very different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the one thing that, you know, I was talking to a kid, the kid who lost in the finals, but really should have won. Um, and he was, how does he solve the hitting problem, right? There's not a lot of college, like in a big city, like in LA, you got UCLA, you got USC, you got guys that are just congregating at, Carson, you know, in my facility, we have every college in the city plays it. In my facility, so you have college guys that can hit with a, you know, top 25, 16-year-old boy. But he was saying that in Rochester, which is a little bit remote, uh, he doesn't have access to hitting. How do you solve that? I mean, I told him, I said, hey, you got to like now with UTR, you can go out and look up people who are grown men who are 14 or 15 UTRs and ask them to come play. Even if you have to pay them to play a set against them. Like, do there that. you go. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean about the resources today, right? You can go online and you can go uh, uh, to the UTR site and find out who lives around you, who's who's what in terms of what their rating is. And you can find the right people. You still need a coach. You still need someone to help navigate things. Uh, and the good thing about Rochester in general, in general, you know, there's university there. You know, so there's college, you know, there's got to be some college players that are pretty darn close. And, and so... I think the key is finding the right hitter, but more importantly, finding the right orchestra conductor. You know, mm -hmm. find that person that can help set you up so that you get the right hits in. So you find the right strength and conditioning person, particularly as kids get into 16s and 18s, that stuff starts to become more important. It's not necessarily, you know, throwing around a million pounds of weights, but it's all the core strengthening, all the this, all this stretching, rehabilitative, rest and recovery stuff. You got to have someone that can help kind of formulate that for you. And uh, but you said you said it UTR, go on, go on UTR site, look around what's going on at the universities and uh, you can figure it out. Yeah. So you went to Tennessee and, you know, I think in that that was sort of the era nowadays, if you go to college. You can make it. We're seeing guys, Marcos Jerome, Mackie McDonald, you know, John Nesner. We're seeing people, Creasy, have good college careers and make a successful transition where for a while there was this stigma that if you go to college, it's a death wish, right? It's a death mm -hmm. sentence to your pro career. So mm -hmm. how, what do you think about then? How did you make it then when college was sort of taboo to the pro career? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I still think there are the naysayers out there, right? And, and I think just in human nature, we are all creatures of that kind of that golden rainbow, the, the rainbow that we see um, of dreamland where, you know, a Roger Federer or a Serena sprouts out, you know, and, and that's what we think it's supposed to be. And that's not what it's supposed to be. The, the, those folks are aberrations. They are the exceptions, not the rules. And so most people can't really be harmed. But I don't think if you go to a good college program, 
and you have the right coach. I mean, think about it, Kamal, you know as well as I do. 99% of the D1 schools, their training facilities, strength and conditioning, um, the nutrition stuff, the sports science, how can that possibly hurt you? I just don't, I don't get it unless it's a, unless it's a, a college coach that's really out of touch and doesn't understand it at all. I just don't see how it can hurt you. And you mentioned Mackie McDonald and Marcus, you know, and, and folks like that. And, and I just think that um, people need to think long and hard about it because for me, if I did go to college, I never would have made it. I never played it. I never played um, junior Wimbledon, junior USO. I never played any of the junior slams. I was probably top 15 in the country, you know, there, thereabouts my last few years. But then when I went to college, I was 48 the first year. My second year in college, I was number two in the nation in college tennis. And that most of that was because of Mike DePalmer Sr. He was a genius and he taught me how to believe in my talent and how to navigate all the kind of clouds of doubt that you have if you're not one of the chosen ones like Roger or Serena or Rafa or these special, special talents. And I learned over a three-year period how to become a pro tennis player. And, and if I didn't go to college, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But I still, I just don't understand why there's a taboo attached. Now, there, there can be caution. You better be careful about who the coach is and what the program is and what they stand for. There absolutely should be caution. But taboo, that's to me, is really uh, a really m misnamed uh, character uh, characterization of it and I, and I just look at at the programs around the country and I look at how much they offer kids and oh yeah god forbid they should get an education too I mean you get a free education if you get a scholarship so that's pretty darn good I just if you're you know coach De Palmer said that to me from the beginning he said look if you're going to be a pro you're going to be a pro you come here you stay here one year great you stay here two years great you stay here three you whatever whenever you're ready you're ready I was supposed to turn pro after my second year because I was ranked two in the country I went out and played summer tournaments and I'm, I'm like, I'm turning pro. And I was all psyched to turn pro. You didn't have to make an announcement. So I just played that summer. I lost, I lost seven weeks in a row in the last round of qualies on the tour level. Talk about getting your ego shattered and trying to deal with that as a 20 year old, 21 year old. And coach Bomber said, no big deal. Just come back this year, play again this year. You'll be ready next year. I think you're ready right now, but you know, I understand what's going on. There's no reason to go out if you're a little bit in doubt. So come back and play another year. Came back and played another year. And that next year, I finished the year ranked one in college. Lost in the, in, at, the, um, at, the, at the, the NCAAs in the quarters. But six weeks later, I made it to the quarterfinals of Wimbledon. I qualified and got to the quarters of Wimbledon. So my ranking went from 290 to 80. And so after that, I was set. But that and I knew that if I didn't do well, I'd go back for my fourth year. You know what I mean? There's so so it's like it's I just I don't understand the taboo part of it. To me, it's just be cautious, do your research about the schools you're interested in, and in particular the coaches and the coaching program and the academic uh, needs that you want for your child, but absolutely a great resource. So parents ask me questions all the time about you know when to move, when to go pro. And I always say the easy answer, or not the easy answer, every response to a tennis question, because it's an individual sport and there's so many factors, as you pointed out, is always, it depends. So if you were a high school senior and you were trying to decide between a UCLA, University of Florida, or turning pro, what would be the marker, right? Is it your ITF ranking? Is it whether an agency is offering you some seed money? What mm -hmm. would be your answer to when is it, when should I go or should I go and do a, or should I go? To right. Coach? Yeah. Yeah. I think your answer is spot on. You know, it, it is, it depends. And, and I think a lot depends on personal situation. Does the kid come from an affluent family where they're, they're going to be okay, no matter what, um, what do they want to do with their life? Uh, or other than tennis, um, how good are they at that moment? Are they, you know, where are they? Are they the best kid in the country and the IMGs of the world or other folks are gonna offer them seed money? 
And then I, okay, I, I really am a huge believer in pros and cons column. My parents taught me this as a kid, and I still do it to this day. Whenever you have a big question, you write pros and you write cons, and then you just weigh them up at the end. Um, but I, I think the most important themes really are when it comes to the individual, how resilient are they? Because you know as well as I do, you're going to get your ass kicked. Excuse my language. I don't care who you are. You get out on the pro tour. You're one of the best kids in the country. You're going to get you're going to get your head handed to you for a while. I mean, these are the best players in the world. You play every single week. And think about it. Junior tennis, how much do they play during the year? How many tournaments do they play the entire year? Guess what? As a pro, you're going to play between, let's say, 22 and 32 to start out with. That means every single week, every person's losing except one. That's tough. That's tough on the ego. So you better be really resilient. So I would look at the personality traits. Like I'm fortunate enough right now to coach, uh, to help coach Taylor Fritz with Mike Russell. Mike's an amazing coach. David Nankin did an unbelievable job uh, before Mike setting the foundation. But Taylor Fritz has a mentality for me. When I got to know this kid, I was like, he's going to make it. You know, whether he's going to be two or 22, this kid's going to make it. I mean, he's tough. He, do, he has what I call relentless competitive fire, no matter what, you know, injury, it doesn't matter. He's going to compete. He's going to fight. He's got weapons and he embraces the possibilities, whether they're positive or negative, it doesn't scare him. And that's tough to teach that. So from the beginning, I knew Taylor was going to be good. How good? I wasn't sure, but I knew he was going to be good and he was going to make it just because of that mindset. So that you have to weigh that when someone said, should they go to college or can they turn pro? Well, can your kid handle getting his backside handed to him for a while? Will it fluster him or her if they're between 125 and 275 ranking wise for 24 months? Will that make them, how do you think that will react to, you know, make them react? And that's why I circle all the way back to what I said initially, you better have a pretty good or orchestra conductor. Because if you don't, and you're going in there with someone that's never done it, never seen it, doesn't know all the miscellaneous stuff, it's real easy for players and their families to have an emotional roller coaster, and that's not what you want. Hundred percent. So you, we talk about those people who have very special circumstances. You mentioned Serena. You mentioned Roger. You've had the opportunity to coach Pete Sampras and Roger. How did you get from playing to coaching Pete Sampras? I mean, you look at some like dream jobs. You look at like the list of guys that they could call. And all of them would say yes, and Pete Sampras chooses you. How does that happen? Yeah, it was kind of, it was an accident. It was a sad accident, actually, for me, because I, at the time, I was actually helping a, a former player, a guy by the name of Jim Grab, who is a, a, a friend and just a lovely guy and was former number one doubles player in the world and top 20. In, he was a very good player. And I just started helping Jim and helping a couple people kind of um, just informally. And then what happened was Tim's coach, Tim Gullickson, got sick, got diagnosed uh, with brain cancer. And, and so when Tim got sick, um, I was friends with both of those guys. I had known Pete from when I played um, and Pete traveled with his brother. I traveled with my brother. We just got to know each other. I was you know, eight years older, but I knew him pretty well. So when Gully got sick, you know, they talked about it, Tim and Gully, and, and they both said, why don't you just ask Paul to help? for a while while I fight this thing. So the goal was for me to help as long as Gully was fighting and then for him to be helping back on tour. Unfortunately, that didn't work out and Tim lost his battle to cancer. And so my, my whole mindset was, how can I make a horrible situation less horrible? You know, And I had one of the best teachers in the world. I was talking to Tim Gully all the time. He was home getting treatments. I'm calling him from the road and, how, you know, learning how to manage Pete's personality, when to, you know, when to throw in things, when to, so I had a great mentor and I was doing it with someone who was a great player, but also knew me, like Pete knew me, but we knew each other. So yeah, he was the great Pete Sampras, but I wasn't, it sounds horrible, but I wasn't as in awe of him because he wasn't Pete yet. He had, mm. you know, he had won, I think three or four majors, um, but I'd known him for a long time, so I felt like our communication was good, and I, I, it was very easy for me to talk to him because we knew each other real well. And then I had Gully mentoring me about the when, the how, and the why of navigating that. So I did that for a year and a half, 
and then you know Tim passed unfortunately and by then I was kind of pretty on my way to understanding how best to help Pete and also I learned a ton from Pete I don't know how bad you feel about this but the amazing thing for me about coaching is I could argue I learn more from each player than they learn from me I mean I've been so lucky Kamal you know, to be with Pete and Roger and Sloan and Tim Henman and Stan and now Taylor. Um, I, I and, and every experience is new. You know, every I'm learning more stuff with Taylor, things that I, you know, that I'm wrapping my mind around that I hadn't been around before. It's a different era. So I, I, I really think that coaching is one of the most enlightening things you can do because sure you have this foundation of what you believe and what you want to do, but in an individual sport, you better have your mind open and you better be willing to be a sponge too. And then most importantly, how can you say it so that individual buys in? Right. You know, it's not a team sport. You're not, you know, you're, you know, I'm not Greg Popovich with the San Antonio Spurs saying, okay, guys, here's what we're doing. Conform to my philosophy. Here's what the program is. Get in line and do it. You know, that's not how individual coaching works, you know, as well as I do. So to me, that's why I still do it. You know, at my my old age, I still love to do it because I've got to figure out. I'm now trying to figure out how best to help a 25 year old kid with Mike Russell. You know, in this with, generation. with Taylor. Yeah, in this yeah, generation, and it's a, a different generation with you know all the social media platforms. Never putting your phone down. Can't focus on one thing for seven seconds. Tough to have a conversation for more than two minutes. You know, all the stuff that we're dealing with socially. So now I'm still rejuvenated by it. I love coaching because of all those things you navigate. So I became a coach accidentally, and I thank my lucky stars that I've been fortunate enough to be around great tennis players, um, but more importantly, better people. And luckily, all the people you mentioned I've talked about, I still call friend and all very dear friends. So I'm, I'm a lucky man indeed. So, you know, that, that's an interesting point because, you know, when I think about, you know, my coaching career too, everybody I coached was a better tennis player than me. I mean, like, you know, I don't. Same I with me. Try to hit with Sloan. Same with me. <laughs> you know, you get you get behind one of Sloan's forehands. Like, you know what? That we need to find a hitter. I'm gonna come and stand behind <laughs> you because this is not gonna be a good right. And so, when you're coaching somebody that has more feel, right, and more talent in their hand than you might, you may have it up here, but it doesn't feel right in their hands, right? And in this sport, you gotta trust your hands, right? Right. And you you've gotta sort of suggest, see how they react, and perhaps their instincts are better than your thought process. And I think yeah, that's perfect. That is something that I think I've learned. Like, you know, hey, I think we should do X, Y, and Z. We do it a couple of times. And then, you know, the second part of this is them being able to have good two-way communication. And I'll say, how did mm -hmm. that feel? And they say, mm -hmm. I wouldn't hit that shot. Okay, perfect. Because let's just work on shit that you would actually hit when I need right. to hit, you know what I mean? I think right. if you've got a good player who has more talent than you ever had and you take your thoughts and mesh it with their hands, if they are a good communicator, it can be a good thing. If they're like, yeah, whatever you think, I'm like, eh, because at no, four yeah, third, I, yeah, it ain't going to be whatever I think. It's going to yeah, be whatever. Yeah, no, I I, yeah, look, you know as well as I do, people that excel on a tennis court tend to be stubborn and have opinions, right? So you got to figure out how to manage that. And, and like you said, look, I, I never, I never won Wimbledon and I'm going to Wimbledon coaching Pete in the finals of Wimbledon. I mean, I know how I felt playing big matches in the quarterfinals of Wimbledon or, you know, but I never been in the finals, but I know how I felt. I felt the nerve. So my, my philosophy really is I have a, I have a couple, I've got, my biggest thing is, the, the player and the individual is made up of three things, their head, which is how they process stuff, how they figure out and problem solve their heart, how well can they unconditionally compete, and then their physical attributes. And so for me, I weigh those three areas. And then within those areas, I have a little kind of a graphic in my mind that's that's a line. And on one end of the line, you have a magician which would be a McEnroe, Agassi, Federer, Sampras. On the other end of the line, you have a mechanic that might be someone like um, Yvonne Lendl or maybe Chrissy Everett or someone, uh, maybe Jim Curry or Thomas Mooster, people like that that are about repetition. N neither side is right, but within mechanic and magician, 
you have to understand how they feel, which is what you're talking about in their hands, and then use those three components so that make them up their head, their heart, and their talent. And then you have to digest all that stuff in your mind. And then to me, my philosophy is how simple after that can I say what I need to say the way they need to hear it? That's kind of how I, that's how, that's what my MO has been as a coach all along. Yeah. So I've been on the court before, um, and you know, the practice court is practice court has so many great moments and so many great stories. And that is where the bond is formed, you know, in addition to the airplane rides and the crazy crap that happens, happens in transportation on the way to matches and that kind of thing. So I've been on the practice court sometimes and, you know, you get to, you, sometimes you get excited and sometimes you're like, okay, you know, you have a night before where you become really clear on where we need to go this preseason. Right. And you get out there and the player turns back and says, you're talking too much. I got it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you when to talk. <laughs> tell me about a time, interesting time with Pete on the practice court, because, you know, he was a professional, right. And they, you know, he had won three slams. He kind of got it, right? Tell me about a time where it was like a little bit of push and pull on the practice court. Are you talking about Pete Sampras? Pete, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you, Pete, it was really, because we knew each other really well and because um, we had a good communication bond and because Gully was helping me, early on, like three months in, we had a dinner one night and Pete basically did say to me, he said, you know, we we have we got to figure out how you can give me a little less information and do it at the at the right time and also you know i trust what you're telling me but it needs to be kind of less less quantity of it the quality is great but i don't need a ton and i also when we're away from tennis need, you know, we both need to make sure, you know, we both need to make sure we have space. Like when I'm, when we're on the road, if we want this to last, I, you can't be around me 24 seven. I can't be around you. We like each other. We know each other forever, but we're gonna be on the road together 34 weeks a year. And that those conversations were perfect because there was no, you're an idiot. I'm this, is, it was just total about how, what do we do to make it better? And then how do we, and then from then forward, it actually was pretty smooth, you know, until, you know, until the end where we kind of got a little stale and, and I kind of, kind of my fault at the end of when Pete got a little bit stale when he got married and didn't win a tournament for 25 months and oh, poor Pete's never going to, you know, a lot of that, I felt like Pete probably should have had a different voice. And I think I stuck around a little too long. And I think that that may have hindered his next chapter, he got the next chapter when he won the U.S. Open again in 2002. But I think, you know, he's going through some stuff where maybe he could have used a new voice. Because I believe all of these relationships, they come to an end. Doesn't That's just the way life is. It's okay. It doesn't mean he's a bad guy. I'm a, it doesn't mean anything other than they come to an end. So that that was, I think I probably should have been a little more aware of that early on. I wasn't. Now as I've gotten older, I think I am aware of it. That's why with Roger, when we stopped after just short of four years, it was the right time. We had dinner, we had dinner in, in, in Dubai. We sat down, actually we had lunch, just me and him. And we talked about it and it was so great. Cause he was like, what do you think? You know, what are you thinking moving forward? And I said, what do you think? And he goes, you know, I, I don't know. I just feel like there maybe should be a little shift. And I, I actually agreed. And I said, I think you're probably right. I'm not, I, I think maybe, you know, you just need to hear a different voice, a different way, but maybe similar philosophies. And it was that simple. And then we talked about who you should hire next. And, and it, you know, it was very mature and really, that was really lovely. But that's, you know, Ro that's Roger's lovely like that. And Pete was totally mature about it. I'll tell you how they're different about absorbing information. During Pete, we got to the quarters of Wimbledon one year and he was serving badly. So finally, after the quarters, he won the tournament this year. But after the quarters, I said, he goes, I'm struggling with my serve. What do you think? It's going on. I said, your toss is drifting to the left and behind you. So you're not getting into the court as well. And you're hitting a lot of serves kind of from a kick serve position that you don't need to be on grass. And he said, okay, let's, let's work on that tomorrow. Okay. This is the day before the semis. And this is a guy that's won before. And, and so it was one of my first years with them. And I was like, okay, how much do we work on it? So I called Gully and talked to Gully. And, and so we went on the court and I said, do you want to work on your serve at the end? He goes, yeah. 
so at the end, we, he, we go to serve and he said, it's a little left and a little behind me. I said, that's, yeah, that's what's happening. And that's why you're missing a lot. He literally hit eight serves and he goes, okay, got it. I was like, that's, that's all. He goes, yeah, I got it. I'm good. And he goes out and wins this tournament, wins the semis the next day and the day after that and served great. And he's just, he's a magician. You know, he felt it. He could mm -hmm. go out there and feel like it was in the balls in the right position. He goes, oh, now I got it. I got it back. I'm good. And mm -hmm. that's it. His confidence mm -hmm. didn't waver, got back. Now, Roger, he'll absorb more information. First time we walked on the court together um, in Zurich, we'd had a bunch of, we'd had a few dinners and stuff just to talk about what we we're going to do and how we're going to do it. The first time we walked on the court, he was hitting for five minutes and he turned to me and he goes, okay, what do you want me to do? And I was like, that's it. I'm just going to tell you what to do and you're going to do it. And, you know, Tig Rogers, you know, he'd won a million titles, right? He's 28 years old at the time, 29 or 30. Even. And, and, and so um, he goes, no, he goes, I want you to tell me. And he said, but I am, you know, I might ask why, because I'd like to know why, but I want you to tell me and back it up with how it's going to help my game. <laughs> but just tell me, tell me what, what you want to do today. He would do drills. You know, he, I've never seen a guy that was so happy on a tennis court. He'd love to play tennis. I would get him doing stuff that was so uncomfortable and no one wanted to do it. And he's laughing, having a good, okay, Roger, you can't back up from the baseline for the next three minutes. You cannot take one step back. You know, and he'd be like, well, why? And I was like, you tell me why. And he goes, well, because I'd like to take the ball early. I said, exactly. So let's play, like, let's practice like how you're going to play a match. And this is exaggerated right now, but this will help you get more of a rhythm of seeing the ball earlier. And so we do stuff like that. And we do things that he didn't, you know, that isn't much fun to do. And you'd be out there with Pierre Paganini, strength and conditioning guy, and laughing and doing stuff with dumbbells and jumps over benches with rackets in his hands and obstacle courses hitting overheads and repetitive stuff side to side and just loving it and just having a great time. And when I started with him, even Pete said to me after my second year, he goes, what's it been like? And I said, the guy loves tennis. He just loves to play. And Pete was like, man, when I was 31, I was done. I was <laughs> done with traveling. And I just, it was a lot. I just had, I had enough. And I was like, I know he loves it. He loves the game. He just loves the game and loves to travel. So two very, very special people, two great people with very different uh, modus operandi that worked for themselves really well. And most important thing is they knew themselves really well. Pete knew exactly how he wanted to be to try to achieve his goals. And Roger knew exactly how he needed to be to, to achieve his goals. Very different, but it worked for them. And that's why you and I as coaches better figure out the personality types. Otherwise you're taking a square peg and trying to jam it into a round hole and it doesn't work. So you got to figure that out in individual sports. <laughs> so one of the things when I think about your background, you think about like tennis. So I, I went to Scotland for, you know, Billie Jean King Cup, formerly Fed Cup. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the Swiss are always going to hire a Swiss coach. Czech Republic is always going to hire a Czech coach. Uh, there's so many great coaches in Spain. They're only going to hire a Spanish coach, right? Uh, but you had a chance to be the captain of, the British team, you know, uh, for the LTA. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen often. Where, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I was the coach. I was the coach. John Lloyd was the captain. So John was the head guy and I was Lloyd. the coach. I, I, I've been really lucky, Kamal. I, I worked for four years for the LTA, uh, for the you know British version of the USTA. I worked for the USTA, running player development, as you said. I worked for Tennis Australia for four years. So I've gotten to see institutionalized tennis which is what I call that because it's an institution. Maybe yeah. I should call it that because you need to go into an, into an institution when you're done. But um, no, I'm just kidding. It's very, you know, it's very institutionalized. It's a business. You know, the USTA is a business. The LTA is a business. Tennis Australia is a business and it's a big company. There are huge amounts of people that work there. You and I are independent contractors. You and Sloan go out there and you do your thing. You know, me and Taylor are out there with Michael Russell. We do our thing. We are our company. Right. So when I worked for the LTA for four years, John was the, the captain and I was head of men's tennis. So I was the coach and tried to, you know, I was the guy, and I was the guy at all the Davis Cup ties that did a lot of the stuff that the captain just delegated to me. But I felt like we had a great camaraderie. 
I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I really enjoyed the team concept of tennis because we don't get to do that much. And I, I miss that because I played basketball and soccer as a kid and and I miss the team stuff. So I love being a part of Davis Cup. Um, but um, in my, that was mostly just because I worked at the LTA. And, and those experiences to me have been so valuable, working for an organization, understanding how to work for, I, you know, when I was running player development in UST, I think I had 38 employees on, you know, that worked under the umbrella that I was the director of. So you learn how to manage and deal with people. And um, look, man, I've been so lucky. I, I've been able to take what I love and turn it into a way to make a living and a life. So thank you very much. Right. <laughs> so when I think about you, I think I see a guy that always has a very brief, kind, constructive word. I can recall uh, being in Carson and we are like having an absolute practice. And I think like one of the guys, maybe Tommy, somebody hit an overhead onto our court, right? And you come over to our court and you come over. I'm like, Paul, don't leave. They're like, what? <laughs> Don't leave. Just stay for a few minutes. And we're hitting, we're hitting, and it is atrocious. Just not going to be the day. You know, some days we're just not yeah. going to have a practice today. So right? it is sometimes, yeah. And you're like, that looks great. Looks good. Guys, keep going. And I'm like, either he is like super nice or just blind or just can tell. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to be Let's one see. of those days where nothing's yeah. going to help. How do you yeah. work with other coaches? Because that day, I was looking for a savior, right? And and yeah. like the way that you like, oh, looks great. Keep going, doing a great job. And it, well, that year ended up being great. That was like preseason mm. 2017. Right. Right, into 2017, like leading right. into 2018 with Miami and French, that kind of thing. So yeah. it ended right. up going great, but that yeah. day was horrible. And that, you would not yeah. say it. <laughs> well, that's, that, well, you know as well as I do, that's the, that's the, that's the challenge for our job, right? Is because we've spend so much time with the players and it's not a whole team it's your one player if your one player's having a crappy day that they just got in a fight with their boyfriend the dog ate their homework they lost their passport the luggage is gone they got what you know nine million things you have one player it's very easy for that one player to have a bad day now if those that bad day turns into a bunch of them that's a problem that's a that is a characteristic that needs to be worked on. But if you have the odd bad day, for me, I'm all about, you know, trying to make it fun. What do you want to do that's fun? You want to play you want to play mini tennis for an hour and a half? Let's just do something fun. Let's serve for targets. You missed the targets. I'm buying dinner tonight. Any restaurant you want. You, you know, if you if you I'm sorry, you missed targets, you're buying. If you hit any of them, I'll buy anywhere you want to go. You know, some something to keep it light and fun and focused. And then there are times where I go, you know what? Screw it. Let's just go grab lunch today. You know, and, and I think that that builds uh, a communication ability with the, with the player that they know that you care more about them as a person than you do about how they're hitting a tennis ball at that moment. And that's that's for the older players, the players that have been around there on the pro tour. For a younger player, it's more I feel like it's more formative and dictatorial as an older player is it's more that and in terms of working with the coaches. Man, I love going out to Carson. I love listening to what David Nankin has to say. I, I love listening to what Maureen Diaz has to say. I love listening to what um, Eric has to say out there. And all the for me, I I don't know. I know what I know, but I don't know everything. You tell me. Like they'll be out there with a fourteen year old girl, and I'll be like, okay, what's you know what's been really good with Tia? Well, how's Tia really bought into this? What's Eva Jovic been doing? That you know, what do you see? How's it work? You know, for me, I I, I I'm still. Yeah, I coach, but I'm a student first and foremost. That's how I look at it. So I like to have collaborative conversations. And every time I do, I tend to pick up one or two good points. And hopefully they pick up one or two good points. And then you just move from there. That's kind of how I look at it. Well, let me ask you this, because you, you've had a chance to touch a lot of people. A lot of, you know, preseason, Carson's a very famous stop for all the players. I look at Taylor. I think of Taylor, Francis, TP, Tommy. They're all kind of like same class, right? What do you think, I mean, Francis is now evolving, right? You know what I mean? In terms of consistency. And it's doing great. Right? What do you think separates it? But Taylor right now is leading the pack, right? And you can look at him and go with the easy answer. He's a bigger kid, bigger serve, right? Mm -hmm. But he also doesn't move as well as, let's say, a Francis right. or a Tommy, right? Sure, so Tommy. Right. Yeah. Separate is, is separating Taylor right now from the pack, and not that there's mm -hmm. like, I mean, you know, Francis is top 20, right? So it's not like there's a 
huge gap. Right. But I would say Taylor right. right now is he's like yeah, he oh, finished. Look, yeah, he, he like, finished like, nine in the he finished nine in the year in the world and got to the European Championships. You told me that this time last year, I would have said, "I'd love for that to happen," but it wouldn't. I I, I wouldn't be betting my house on it. You know, <laughs> I thought Taylor could get there at some point, but I, I I thought, and this year has been a year of total a lot of adversity. He's had injuries. He's had a nagging foot. Um, stress fracture, stress reaction. He, we haven't gotten to do, we haven't gotten to do 70% of the stuff we wanted to do this year. And this kid's still finding ways to win. Um, now, I think in the long term, that's a bit, that's not great because it can be a veil. You can put a veil over stuff in terms of trying to get better. But for a year, for a period of time, it's fine. But now, you know, this off season, we're going to be talking about, okay, now how do we get better? How do we get better moving forward? Last year is how do we survive? Right. And then his competitive spirits take over. I think personally, with all everything I've been around, he's the best player mentally of that age that I've seen out there. And I I think better than any of them. And I think that's the difference. Um, I think when you combine his ability to unconditionally compete um, with his ability to try to problem solve under pressure. I don't think he has a peer in his age group that's at the same level as he is. And look, ask him about on-court coaching. He doesn't want it. It's like, no, if I can't figure it out on the court, that's that's on me. You know, I don't want these guys to be able to talk to their coaches. I we got to figure it out. That's and when when I saw that response, I was so happy. I was like, right. that's my job. My job is to give you or the players the tools to figure out what happens when you're under adversity. When you're in center court at Wimbledon and there's no place to hide, there's you're naked. There's nothing like it on the planet. A good coach and a good player has a dynamic where that player is in that moment and they're trying to problem solve. You. Okay, what should I do? They're not going, what do I do? Can you tell me where to serve? How do I do this? What The players got it. That's what our job is as a coach. That's why I love the individuality of tennis. And that's why also I'm not for on-court coaching. But – that being said, that's the reason why I think Taylor's better than everybody right now is that I just think he's a level higher than them in that area, that head and heart area combined. He's better in terms of just that. Remember, I said head, heart, talent, talent wise. Is he way ahead of all those guys? Absolutely not. You mentioned it. France is a better athlete. Tommy Paul's a better athlete, but they're not as good upstairs as Taylor is. Not right now. Mm-hmm. They can be. But Taylor can also work on his athleticism. He can get stronger. He can get faster. He can get more nimble at the net. So that's why tennis is great. But those are the reasons why I think Taylor's a little bit better right now. So you mentioned that you worked uh, for institutions, right? And those are institutions. And I would say when you think about the institution or the federation now, that sort of, you know, I think on the women's side where Canada had like a run where Canada had like, you know, um, Felix and Ronich and Bianca. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jeannie and Layla, right? And you think on the men's side, you think of Italy right now with all those guys, like they are like doing it right. What did they do? Or was it just, you can't, these these people, you, these federations kind of get lucky with the well, wave of I, I, talent yeah. who's all the same age and then you just got to make sure they make it. Yeah, I think it's a little cyclical like that. It's just a little cyclical, but also... Look at what Italy's done in terms of their transitional tour possibilities. Look at the amount of events that they've created that's given their young players opportunity to play. It has gone off the charts. And what happens a few years down the road? Musetti, Berrettini. Um, who else is there? Musetti, Berrettini. Center. Am I missing? Center. Center. Yeah, yeah. So, and then if you look at what's going on here in the States, we're losing, we're losing events left and right. And, and we're losing all the transitional events. It's really difficult. Come out. I've been lucky enough to spend some time and help Southern Cal a little bit, Southern Cal Tennis Association. And they put together a group of people that have done an amazing job adding transitional tour events. And they're doing it again this year. Um, the SCTA board um, and Bob Hochstetter and um, Chris Boyer have put together a group and have gotten a bunch of sponsors who are trying to do this to help the game. Because you know as well as I do, you're not making money putting together $75,000 challengers. You know, right. you're, you're not doing that. 
So you have to do something for the community. And the folks here in Southern Cal have been amazing and it's gonna grow again this year. So they're really trying to do it here in Southern Cal and they're really trying to be a seedling. So maybe the other, the other uh, sections around the country will see it. And to me, hopefully at the end of the day, the USTA will see it. But the USTA, there's some business stuff going on where they got some financial stuff they got to deal with. And right. so because of that, it's tough to spend $6 million on a bunch of transition tour events. So they're trying to wrestle their own business demons to then hopefully rekindle that. But I think without having significant opportunity to transition from junior or college level to the pros, you're doing a huge disservice to the players that may be able to make it and make a living doing it. And I think that's why those countries that you mentioned, in particular, Italy, Italy especially has done a great job with it. And I think that uh, I hope we can, you know, take a page off of that uh, book a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, you know, last year we held three WTA tournaments, this year we held an 80K. So my, my, my next sort of thought was, what can we do better to grow the game in the U.S.? Because I think we are, there are people that are in this like invisible middle and they can either go work for Goldman Sachs. They're like three months from either right. going to work at Goldman Sachs or sort of really making it. And, you know, this summer, USDA put on, we put on 80K, USDA subsidized it. And out of that, right, out of that one investment, Ben Shelton had a quality car to Cincinnati, okay? He gets to the finals. So they have to upgrade the quality car to a main draw wild card. Which, you know, you could not make it out of qualies, but make it to the fourth round of the main draw. Like, just matchups, right? Had you had to play qualies, you might have played a different set of players where you probably wouldn't have qualified, right? So he gets a wild card uh, to main draw. And beats Casper Rule, wins two rounds, ends up, you know, signing a deal, turning pro, now just won two tournaments in a row. So I think I look at three tournaments in a row. Didn't, didn't you just win three? Yeah. yeah. So in my, in my mind, I'm thinking – more merging that with your thought about what Italy's done, that investment that the USTA and sort of subsidizing that event created another bona fide American pro and one that's African American, which we like, you know what I mean? Like sure. that investment started a career, you know what I mean? And so I think like, but again, the event didn't make money, right? right. Had, they, had they not subsidized it, we would have lost a hundred grand, which right. Was, Running a nonprofit, right. we can't afford to do, right? So right. we've, we've got to do more of that because that has shown to create a bona fide American pro. I'll give you another story. Last year, the WTA subsidized a 125 at, at, at our facility. Emma Kanu gets to the founds of the 125, uses the points, gets into qualities of the U.S. Open, ends right. up winning the U.S. Open. Right. And didn't get into our 125. We gave her a wild card. So without that one, that investment in the 125, she doesn't get in the U.S. Open quality. She doesn't win the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and now she's three hundred million dollars. It's, it, it's, it's amazing. Right. Because, look, there are stories like that. What you and I are talking about doesn't mean now all of a sudden everyone's going to make a living. But yeah. the people, you know, the people that need the help that have the possibility, it's an it's it's absolutely impossible to quantitatively measure what that impact will do. What is it going to do for Ben Shelton, what he's done this year? And even at the tail end of this year, he's winning three challengers in a row. I mean, what, how do you measure, you know, the ranking goes up, whatever, 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 but how do you measure that? That was all here in the States. He got to play here in the comfort of his own, you know, uh, basically his own environment where he grew up. And without that, it's a struggle. These kids are flying all over the world to try to play challengers and lose money in, in ITFs, and it's impossible. So, so basically, Kamal, the reason that I agree to do this is now I'm going to tell you your job is to get one of these huge companies to donate like $15 million so we can <laughs> – you can do that, can't you? And we'll just set up all these events around the U.S. Come so on, uh, you can do it, man. But see that that's that's the <laughs> entrepreneur in you. That's the entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, but I exactly. you know it's funny. I so I am figuring out a way to sort of make that make sense for an investor, right? Sure. For the federation, sure. but then also USDA has got to figure out a way how to use some of the U.S. Open proceeds, funnel it down, right. and sort of yeah. partner 
right? We got to be yeah. partners. It can't be right. Paul Leonard Cohen, Kamal Murray trying to save tennis, right? It's, we yeah, it's, it's com- look, it's complicated. I totally get it. I make a little bit of tongue-in-cheek comment. It is, it is compl- I understand the complexity of it, but I, you asked the simple question, the simple answer, it's really easy is we don't have a ton of those events anymore. And thankfully, where I spend a lot of my time in Southern Cal, these guys are doing a great job planting some seeds last year there was a bunch this year there's going to be more you know we're going to try to keep building which i think is a huge benefit so last thing about tennis and then i ask you a, a dad question um play site so you're involved in play site and i think that you know you obviously also we work together at tc you've had so many jobs which of those jobs number one you enjoy the most obviously i would say coaching if you ask me uh and then which of those was the most challenging I think um, I think coaching is my favorite one just because of the relationships, because it's really hard to coach an individual sport and not get to know that person really well. And, and then within that, you sprinkle out all the tentacles of the other relationships that come from it mm-hmm. and all the stuff you not the stuff that I teach, but all the stuff I get to learn, too. Yeah. And if I can participate and add value and be in that environment, to me, that's hugely beneficial I think all the things I've done, I've, I've found a lot of positives. I think really the, the most challenging thing is, um, is probably working in institutionalized tennis, working for a USTA and LTA Tennis Australia, just because of the complexity of turning a business, because it's a business, into what you and I do, which is coaching individuals. And then all of the things that intertwine because of that and all the checks and balances, the administrative stuff, um, the rationalizations, the kind of definitions of what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it. You spend a lot of time um, reacting to reactions instead of actually doing what you should be doing. And to me, that's that's one of the things that's a pitfall that doesn't make it impossible to do, just makes it really challenging. Yeah. So now my last question. I've got three kids. Older daughter doesn't love tennis, but you know, she can, she can, she got a big forehand, right? Probably could have been something special. Uh, how do you, as a coach, deal with the fact that neither one of your kids, you know, probably could have been the tennis player they are? You know, I always like, eh, I don't want to push them. I don't want to be dad on the court, you know, coach on the court, right. because I know I'm intense. And I would be coach at home. You know what? You don't get to eat tonight because you like dog to practice. You know, that that would <laughs> that would be me, right? Go eat. Yeah. That. that would be me. So how do you balance that? Because I know exactly why my my kids felt pressure to like, you know, we meet somebody, yeah. and, oh, you must be great. You know, that yeah. you know, that's your dad. Yeah. Like, how, how a, do you look, deal? that's that that's a tough one. I mean, for me, my oldest son Nicholas um was a really good athlete and and um played tennis, never played competitively, but did have sprinklings and moments where he wanted to and actually talked to me and my ex-wife about going to voluntaries or an academy. And and we, you know, I, whenever he brought it up, I kind of mentioned, if you go there, this is kind of what your life is going to be like. <laughs> if you want to do this, we'll support you, but just understand the sacrifices as well. And then it kind of dissipated. I, I think he probably, if you asked him, Nicholas would probably tell you he, that he wished I pushed him a little harder. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad I didn't because I kind of wanted him to do what he wanted to do and figure it out. And he became um, a very good basketball player, played D3, also was a walk on at University of Tennessee when they were ranked one in the country in basketball. So he mm-hmm. can play some hoops. He was a very good athlete. And most importantly to me, he is an amazing human being and he's an unbelievably secondarily, he's an unbelievably successful business person. And that's how I feel with my youngest Emmett and also with Olivia. They're paramount to me is that they're good people and all three of them are amazing people. And, and so from that, they're going to find their joy. And so I feel like the sacrifices that I made worked for me. But I can totally see people going, I'm not doing that to my kid. And and I can understand why, because it's a lot of imbalance. There's a lot of skipped kind of evolution of adolescence if you do that. And I'm not so sure that without a really balanced, hands-on approach with parents, that it's a good thing for kids. 
you have to do it. I'm not saying it's bad, but you just have to make sure you monitor it the right way to make it a good thing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it can be a bad thing. It can be scarring. So I really don't I don't really have any regrets. I like I said, I'm so proud of my three kids and so lucky they're all happy and healthy. And, um, you know, my biggest theme is that uh, they enjoy their life and that's what they're doing. Because I, I often and parents sometimes I, I love it. Sometimes parents throw it back at me. They say, well, you know, such and such does Ashley doesn't want to do this. I say she's a kid. She doesn't have a choice. And that, well, you gave your kid a choice. I'm like, well, that's different. I had to go home with them. With this one, better get on that court right now. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 find, I find myself being a hypocrite. Sometimes. No, no, no. But that's but but no, but that's what I meant about me explaining to Nicholas. I'm like, if you're gonna do this, this is what that means. So if they're at your facility and they're there to do to do the program, this is what the program is. You gotta get on the court. That's right. what we're doing. That's a different now. If you whether or not you show up, that's up to you. But once you're here, you're mine. You know, right. you're mine. And that, you know, and that's what the the great Nick Volatari did when I was down there. He's like, dude, you get your ass on the court. This right. is not a maybe. You get your ass on the court. If you don't want to be here, don't be here. But if you're here, this is what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 lastly, you know, it's a sad time. We see Roger leaving the game. We see, you know, Rafa slowing down if there is a, such a thing. And we see Novak sort of, to me, you're in finals. He looked 15 pounds bigger, right? Muscle. He looked strong. Body was fresh because he didn't play that much this year. Um, you know, I think... Novak will eventually, you know, obviously win the most Grand Slams and probably could get to 26 if he wins one or two a year for the next three years. What is your thought on that um, between those big three? Yeah, I think I think Novak's, I thought this all along, I thought Novak's going to end up with the most. Um, and, you know, it's so funny because just because you say that people, oh, you hate Roger, or you hate Roger. <laughs> Look, I am such a fan of excellence, and we've been so spoiled by these three guys. I'm so in awe of all of them, but I just think Novak's going to win the most. And I think that if you look at the last decade, uh, Novak has been the most accomplished of the three. And and if you look at their records, he's been the most accomplished. Um, I I don't believe in the greatest. I don't. I don't. I try never to use that because I don't. Cause I'm not going to compare Pete to these guys and I'm not going to pair compare Borg to Pete or Rod Laver to Borg. It's different eras. I just think it's apples and I don't think, I think it's unfair to the sport. I'll let everybody else argue about it. You can say most accomplished. That's fine. Just look at the records and then figure it out. But I don't necessarily mean that's the greatest. All I do know is that we've been so spoiled and it's going to be so sad when they're all gone and we're still trying to deal with Serena maybe not playing as well. I'm hearing these little wrinkles and maybe she's going to show up and play a little bit. And that one, she's so competitive and she's so amazing. Nothing she does will surprise me, but I want them all to play as long as they want to play. Um, but you're right. I just think Novak's going to win the most. That's just the way it is. Well, let me ask you this question as a follow-up to the Serena, the Nadal. When you are sort of well accomplished and one of the greatest of all time, do you feel staying too long hands younger players or players that may not deserve it a little piece of your legacy with some of these wins <clears throat> are sort of late in your career perhaps not fit to play perhaps not 100 percent, perhaps mentally mm -hmm. you know right I got you. Yeah, yeah yeah i totally got you to me it doesn't i don't look at it like that and and the reason i don't look at it like that is it's just part of the evolution i think all-time greats deserve to, to end the way they want to end. I, I, like for me, I don't know why you would want to if you couldn't win, but look, Pete didn't win a tournament for 25 months, Pete Sampras, 25 months. You're step slow, you got married, you have a kid now, you don't really like tennis, what are you doing? And I remember talking to him after he lost at Wimbledon to George Bastel and, and I wasn't coaching them and he said, what do you think? And I said, about what? And he said, about me and my game. And I said, well, what do you want to do? You know, he said, I, I want to win another major. And I said, okay, here's what I think. And then I laid it out there for him. And I said, this is what you need to do. You got to get in a more positive mind. You got to practice this way. Here's how you have to approach your life now. You have to find energy, even though you're tired from the being on a tour this long. And he put together a plan and he executed it. And six weeks later, he won the U.S. Open. He had won a tournament in 25 months. And that's the last match he ever played. Now, if he never did that, 
I feel like that would have been sad because I, to watch someone with that steely mindset hit a speed bump for a pretty long period of time and go, you know what? I can do this still. I'm going to figure it out. And then to do it and walk away, that's awesome. But that's Pete. And I think everybody should get to do it the way they want to do it. The legends should do it the way they want to do it. I try to remember them when they're at their all-time highs. But look, it's a long year. There's a lot of matches, you know, playing 1,500 matches, and they're, they're going to lose some. Well, I think the thing that sticks out to me of that story is he asked you, what do you think? And when you get the athlete, I'm, I can think of a time early 2018, right? I think when you get the athlete to say, okay, what do you think? Then you know, okay, now they're, now they're listening. This is my chance to say what I've been wanting to say. And then you see them sort of take off when it comes right. to them. When they're, that like, as a coach, when you get that question, you're like, oh, shit, here we go. This is my yeah. chance, right? No, uh, and that's how I felt. And that's how I felt with Pete. And our relationship was strong enough. I didn't need a job. I was running player development at the USC. I didn't need a job. And he was one of my dear friends still. And I wasn't working with him at the time. And I ended up helping him uh, that for, you know, the next few months. But it was all, it was him. You know, he was, I, there was no, no hidden agenda. He said, what do you think? I said, he knew how well I knew him and trusted my thoughts. And he heard him, but then he, in his mind, put it together and said, this is what I'm going to do. And that steely laser-like focus, I haven't seen in very many athletes. He's one of the quietest assassins that's ever been around. That mm. man had a focus like very few others. Mm. Well, Paul, it's been a real treat to talk to you. I'm like so grateful. I finally got you to say yes. I know. Finally, your people <laughs> reached out to my people. We got together and look at what happened. <laughs> Hey, this has been a Tennis.com podcast with uh, one of the best minds on tour, uh, an entrepreneur, a commentator, a coach, a mentor, not only to players, but to other coaches, uh, Paul Anacone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, my friend. It's always a pleasure.